Thank you, Ambassador, for your time. Uh, we know that German Foreign Affairs Council has said that Russia can attack NATO countries and we have five to nine years to prepare. The Polish uh, head of Polish National Security Service uh, was even more skeptical. It gave uh, around three years. So what is your take? How much actually we have and why? Well, I would start by noting how much Russia has lost through this unprovoked war of aggression inside Ukraine. They've lost hundreds of thousands of their own troops, and they've lost a, a tremendous amount of equipment and valuable capabilities, high-end capabilities. And so we could argue about whether or not they can reconstitute those forces and reproduce some of those capabilities in a few years or in a decade. But what's important is that the NATO alliance is is not waiting. The NATO alliance is very focused on your real-time security needs. We understand that the Baltic states feel this war of aggression in ways that other members of the alliance do not. And for that reason, from day one, from when the war began, we immediately started flowing forces into Eastern Europe, not just the United States, but many other members of the alliance. We have new multinational battalions in Eastern Europe that are scalable to a brigade. We have new plans, new strategy, new doctrine to ensure we can defend every inch of NATO territory. And we're focused on hybrid threats, not just tanks rolling across borders, but we're focused on cybersecurity. We're focused on disinformation, critical infrastructure. And so this alliance is readying itself to deter and defend against any form of Russian aggression on NATO territory. So Russia could take a few years, it could take many years. We're not going to wait for that. We'll take steps now to ensure that Latvia has what it needs to protect itself. But we know that Russian military industry currently works in three shifts. We have seen that European military industry is much slower to, to speed up with a, with a production. What makes you think that we can outrun Russians? Well, on production, I think there's a lot of good news there. In the United States, we've been able in very short time to significantly increase our production on many capabilities. I would say just on 155s alone, we've been able to almost double our production with a goal to move far beyond that. Many European countries, uh, companies have also succeeded in ramping up their production. It is not the case that no one in Europe is is uh, able to do kind of 24-hour shifts. That is happening in some places uh, throughout Europe. So I think there's a lot to point to in terms of what the NATO alliance is doing to increase defense production among the allies. Russia is also, for the obvious reasons, trying to increase its production. But I'm not worried. I see tremendous progress through NATO, through the European Union, and through individual countries that are getting very creative and very innovative in looking for ways to work between the public sector and the private sector to both backfill our stock, uh, stocks that have declined, but also to ensure that Ukraine, Ukrainians have the capabilities that they need as well. But in spite of all you have all you have just mentioned, we see that Russian rhetoric is becoming more and more aggressive. A couple of days ago, Putin threatened uh, Latvia uh, about uh, consequences to our act actions. How seriously do we have to take it and so that we don't fall in the same trap that West fell in when it said, no, Russia will never attack Ukraine? Well, I'll say a couple things on that front. One, Russia is the number one priority here across the alliance. <clears throat> Much of what we do is focused on the Russian threat and ensuring that we have everything we need to deter and defend against any form of Russian aggression. In terms of Russian rhetoric, We've been discouraged by Russian rhetoric since this began. You'll remember that there were moments throughout this war where the Russians have threatened to use tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, they have threatened um, uh, the Ukrainians. They've threatened neighbors. They've threatened allies. So any time they threaten Latvia or any other NATO ally, we take that very seriously. No one brushes that off or takes it lightly. Um, and that's why we're moving out with these concrete measures to ensure that 
that your country, but not just your country, all of our friends on the eastern flank have the resources and the troops and the capabilities that they need to cope with any possible contingency. So again, we take the rhetoric seriously. We're preparing ourselves and making dramatic changes to NATO planning, force structure, um, and our doctrine to ensure that we're at the ready. Security has been the focus of your life uh, well before you became ambassador um, to NATO. How can you tell when uh, when Russians are just it's bravado when they is when they are actually threatening somebody? Well, there are a number of ways that we can verify what they're threatening to do. Um, sometimes they threaten to do something, and it can be posturing, it can be bluster, but again, we take that very seriously. We monitor their movements very closely, particularly as it relates to their troops, their operations in Ukraine, but also any changes to their posture globally we're going to be monitoring quite closely. So it's a situation where we've seen their playbook many times. We've seen that they like to use disinformation. They like the nuclear saber rattling, which again, we take very seriously. But on that question, you know, despite the fact that there's been a considerable amount of nuclear saber rattling, we have no indication that they're preparing to use nuclear weapons. So. Again, we have to draw from our experience in watching their playbook over many years. We're all deeply familiar with the hybrid tools that they like to use. And for that reason, we've been able to, in some ways, outmaneuver and outsmart them by using an unprecedented amount of um, we've shared an unprecedented amount of intelligence with our allies. We've built up new policies, new tools. I think we're in a much better position today to cope with Russian hybrid th threats than we have been in the past. In recent weeks or months, there has been experts and publications saying that uh, Donald Trump could pull uh, United States out of NATO. How should Europe prepare for that? Well, what I would say is that, look, we have a society right now that is quite polarized. We have uh, a number of issues where Republicans and Democrats disagree. But there's one issue where there is deep bipartisan support, or there are a few issues. And fortunately, one of those issues is NATO. Americans fundamentally understand why this alliance matters. They know that America helped create this alliance. They know that NATO serves America. American interests, but also the interests of our allies, and that at the end of the day, we are stronger together. That is our motto around here, but we mean it when we say it. So irrespective of who ends up sitting in the Oval Office next year after our election, I have faith that the American people and Congress remain deeply committed to this alliance, and that will not change depending on an election in the United States. Currently, NATO is looking for a new Secretary General, also Latvian former Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Karinc, has expressed his interest. How do you, how do you evaluate his uh, chances of success to become a uh, new Secretary General of NATO, especially because he, has, uh, he considers one of his assets the fact that he knows United St States very well uh, because he, has, he was born and, and raised there? Well, first of all, I'd have to back up and say we've been lucky to have Jens Stoltenberg as our Secretary General for almost 10 years now, and his leadership, particularly over the last two years, has been indispensable. We were very grateful last year when he agreed to an extension. That worked out very well. It was nice to have him continue to lead us during this horrific war that's unfolding, continues to unfold uh, in Ukraine. We are, though, at the point where he is going to move on and the alliance is going to be selecting a new secretary general that will likely be announced at the Washington summit next July. The alliance is in the process of looking at a variety of candidates. We're lucky to have a wealth of options. Various folks have expressed an interest in, in the position. I wouldn't want to get into individual candidates at this point, but I'm confident that we're going to be able to find the right person to carry this alliance forward to continue to address future challenges. 
And final question. Um, there is a general agreement that uh, Ukrainian counter-offensive uh, this summer has failed. Why do you think that happened? And how much blame there is on the West for late uh, provision of different weapons and not giving that type of weapons that Ukrainians have been asking for? Well, failed is a very strong word, and I think it's a discredit to the Ukrainians to say that they failed. What's happened over the last two years is that the Ukrainians have showed a remarkable ability to push the Russians out of their territory. Since the war started, Ukrainians have regained 50% of their territory, and they've done it with incredible innovation and skill and leadership. And so... Yes, on the counteroffensive, they had ambitious aims. We all had hopes. But we're not giving up on the Ukrainians. They are continuing to fight. We will continue to flow assistance to our friends in Ukraine. And let's not paint a dark picture. That's what Russia wants us to do. Instead, let's celebrate the victories that the Ukrainians have had and ensure that they can keep fighting. That needs to be our focus collectively inside the alliance. Let's Let's look forward and get them the assistance that they need. Will U.S. Congress help with assist, financial assistance to Ukraine? Because that is still a problem. I'm confident that they will. We have had some debates, but the large majority of members of Congress in the House and the Senate support Ukraine. And this is a priority for the president. And I'm sure we're going to be able to secure additional assistance for Ukraine. Thank you, Ambassador, so much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you.